views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Public Health America, a weekly program produced by BronxNet in partnership with Mercy College. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Here on Public Health America, we speak with experts from an array of specialties across the liberal arts and health professions to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. We also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a liberal arts college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings, and engage in civil debate. Our experts will share decisions they made and support they received that helped them to beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Hello, welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Uh, it's a privilege to have Dr. Christine Torres, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Montefiore and Albert Einstein College of Medicine join us today. Christine, welcome to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I know you've been doing some cutting edge work on the opioid uh, epidemic and addiction medicine. Uh, set the table, let us know what's, uh, what's the work you're doing. Sure. So just to sort of set the context, obviously, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis and an overdose epidemic, uh, sort of internationally, but also obviously in the U.S. And um, actually, the Bronx happens to be an epicenter of this crisis where we see more overdose deaths in absolute number and the highest rates of all of the five boroughs in all of New York City. Um, and we've seen this sort of rising trend in overdose deaths for the last several years. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of only worsened those. Um, and we're seeing higher numbers than we've ever seen before. And so, you know, we're at a real pivotal time where it's really important to sort of uh, embrace addiction medicine um, within all other forms of healthcare and really aggressively treat um, these chronic medical illnesses that are substance use disorders and addictions. So I am trained as an internist and also an addiction medicine specialist with expertise in that. Um, and what I have done along with my team has really created an inpatient addiction consult service at Montefiore's Weiler Hospital. So anyone admitted to the hospital who happens to have a substance use disorder, whether that's the primary reason they're being admitted to the hospital, so say they had a non-fatal opioid overdose, um, or they have, say, a complication from their injection drug use, um, a bacterial infection, something like that, their team can actually consult us um, and have an expert in addiction medicine talk to the patient, diagnose um, and screen for any substance use disorders, and then offer any sort of medication or psychosocial treatment. And really, we think this is sort of you know, the cutting edge and the new standard of care that's going to be emerging for treating substance use disorders during this crisis. You know, I think this is a difficult question. So uh, if there's no clear answer, uh, no harm, no foul. Um, how does one parse out the impact of the pandemic versus general uh, stress slash availability of opioids uh, in the Bronx or in the United States? Like, how do you know what to attribute the epidemic to is in terms of opioids? Is that is that fair? Yeah, I think it's we're sort of in the midst of a perfect storm. I think you're hitting on a lot of things. So with the COVID-19 pandemic, I think that's come with a ton of anxieties and stressors for people, which are obviously um, triggers for using substances like opioids. Also, we're seeing, you know, at least initially, a lot of clinics had shut down. Um, and so obviously availability for mental health services and addiction treatment uh, was really, really limited. 
And then we also saw people were much more isolated with all of the public health um, encouraging social distancing. So people were more likely to use substances alone, which again puts them at risk of overdose. And then last but certainly not least, um, is that we also saw changes in the actual drug supply. And so um, while we've seen fentanyl, which is like a synthetic opioid analog, increasing in the supply in New York City for the last several years, again, this really skyrocketed during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's really hard to say which of those trends were already on the up and up before the pandemic hit, um, but certainly none of those have gotten better since it started. So thank you. That's very helpful. Let, so. This may not be your area um, of study. And if it isn't, just tell me and we'll move on to the next question. You know, whether it's heroin or opioids, um, well, I'll tell you what, let me start with this. How much is the work you're doing misuse of prescription drug use versus heroin use? Let's start with that. So first I'll sort of preface that with saying that at this point, polysubstance seems to be the rule as opposed to the exception when we talk about substance use and substance use disorders. So more often than not, people are not just using a single substance or a drug class, they're using multiple. So people are using stimulants, cocaine, methamphetamines, um, opioids, heroin, pills, um, alcohol, et cetera. And so people are often using more than one substance at a time. When we talk about opioid use disorder in particular, um, at least in the South Central Bronx where I practice, most of our patients um, have an opioid use disorder where their primary substance of use is heroin or what we're now more frequently seeing, fentanyl. Um, though of course people also have substance use disorders and opioid use disorders for opioid prescription agents. Sometimes people will say they started with prescription agents. Sometimes people will say they start with heroin. Um, it really sort of varies, but I would say by and large of all the opioid use disorder that I treat um, at Montefiore in the South Central Bronx, it's primarily um, non-prescribed opioids. Um, so again, heroin and fentanyl being the primary substances of choice. Fair enough. And um, so that was the easy question. Here's the difficult one. You know, I've been tracking uh, heroin addiction for 20 or 30 years. Where do we have a sense of where it's being trafficked from? Where is this coming from? Like, how do we cut off the supply? I mean, I imagine that as a doctor, that's not your primary concern. You're meeting people at the doorstep that are overdosing uh, and making sure that they get the treatment they need. But do is there any discussion about uh, where these drugs are coming from? So like I said, I think the biggest challenge in the opioid crisis is really the emergence of fentanyl. So in synthetic opioid that is 50 to 100 times more potent um, than heroin or morphine. And so very, very small amounts of this, even in opioid tolerant people can actually lead to a fatal or a non-fatal overdose. Um, and so this fentanyl is really not um, prescribed fentanyl. So this is illicitly manufactured fentanyl that comes from overseas and can be shipped you know, anywhere internationally, but that's how it's uh, getting into at least our drug supply. And really, you know, one of the things that we approach, you know, all substance use disorder treatment with um, is a lens of what's called harm reduction. Um, and so we acknowledge that many things that people do, including using substances, are associated with harms. How can we as treatment professionals um, and addiction medicine providers really help to decrease the harms of any of that use? Because we know people, um, their treatment goals in terms of their substance use disorder treatment can range anywhere from, you know, complete abstinence from the treatment to just using and decreasing those harms. And so when we think about harm reduction in terms of the supply, we really are talking about a safe supply of substances for people using. So we know there's a safe supply for alcohol. People buy alcohol and they know exactly what the content is um, in each of those bottles. Nothing exists like that for opioids um, in terms of heroin, fentanyl, that 
people just don't know what's in their supply. And there's a huge push in the harm reduction um, literature and the addiction medicine space to develop a safe supply so people know exactly what they're using uh, to help prevent the harms like opioid overdoses. So what is the, uh, in terms of fentanyl, um, is that being manufactured in the U.S. or is it uh, uh, manufactured outside of the U.S. and shipped in? How, how is, if that's the drug that's 50 times more dangerous than heroin or morphine, which is uh, horrifying, where is it coming from? Yeah, it's generally thought to be internationally produced, non-prescription, illicitly manufactured fentanyl and synthetic analogs that are even more potent than fentanyl. So things like car fentanyl, things like that. Um, so it, you can see how quickly it gets very, very scary. Um, but these things just aren't regulated, right? This is a, an unregulated market where people are producing these things. Um, and shipping them overseas. So it's incredibly, incredibly hard to regulate. And so hence um, the real need and emergence for a safe supply so people can know exactly what's in the content of the things that they're consuming. Fair enough. Um, just 30 seconds left. What is the next step of your research or clinical work? Yeah, so like I said, our goal is to really integrate addiction medicine into standard medical care, and it's been siloed from that uh, for many, many, many years. Um, and so our work is really about integrating into all of our healthcare systems, so offering people the standard of care, which is um, really the opportunity to see an addiction medicine expert whenever they present to care with any sort of related harm from their addiction, um, and also really integrating addiction medicine into all medical education. Um, and so we are offering um, really an intensive sort of elective and rotations for all of our internal medicine residents at Montefiore uh, so that they rotate with us and get um, expertise from the experts and also an integrated curriculum into the Albert Einstein College of Medicine uh, medical student curriculum as well. So they all have some sort of baseline understanding of what addictions are and how to treat them, particularly during this crisis. So training is really important and that makes a lot of sense. We're going to take a quick break. We'll we return, we'll speak with Dr. Torres about her college experience and how that helped set the stage for her next steps. This is Public Health America, take care.
Welcome back to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. So, uh, Christine, in this segment, I always open with the same question. Um, where were you born and what were some of your formative experiences? Good question. Um, so I'm originally from a really small town in New Mexico. It's called Los Lunas. Um, and that's where I was born and grew up. And really most of my family is all from there. Um, I would say probably one of my most formative experiences was um, actually I attended a private school in Albuquerque starting in about middle school and high school um, and really had the opportunity to sort of see what a higher education sort of look like. Um, and so I got the opportunity to have a really wonderful mentor um, as a college guidance counselor to really um, help me through that educational process. Um, and I ended up going to Dartmouth in New Hampshire, which was sort of unheard of. I hadn't even heard of it <laughs> before I applied. Um, and I was sort of the first person in my family to actually graduate from college. So um, I feel like attending that school and having those kind of mentors usher me through that kind of process was um, incredibly transformative and sort of set the stage for why I think, you know, getting an education um, and achieving, you know, a career in medicine was so important for me. That's wonderful. Um, let, let's put some legs on that. So you went to Dartmouth, uh, uh, by all measures, a pretty decent school. Um, uh, tell us about a mentor that stood out for you that uh, helped you define what your next steps might be. I guess I'll say first going to college, particularly going from the Southeast, um, or sorry, the Southwest to, you know, the East Coast, um, sort of like a, an elite institution like that was a bit of a culture shock. Um, and I think it took me a couple of years to sort of um, get my sea legs about me and really, you know, sort of understand this whole new culture that I had sort of been immersed into. Um, but part of that was finding out what I really enjoyed. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor, even from like a really, really, really young age, even though no one in my family um, had been in medicine. And I really just had sort of romanticized it as, as, you know, like the pinnacle of what it means to get an education and to help people. Um, and so I really didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into, but I feel really fortunate in that um, I found a lot of great mentors in um, one of my undergrad professors. Um, he actually had a lab uh, at the college, uh, was doing research in MRSA and sort of took me on as one of his research assistants um, and really got to better understand science uh, and the whole research process um, and really sort of was one of the budding um, ways that my love of medicine sort of started um, and really got me down a career to look at to med school. Um, and I ended up staying at Dartmouth for medical school as well um, and a career in in healthcare. That's great. Um, where did you do your residency? Yeah, so I, I stayed um, at Dartmouth for my medical school. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoyed doing there was working in our um, uninsured clinic um, for patients in the sort of upper valley area. So New Hampshire and Vermont. And I really, really enjoyed working in with sort of underserved populations. And I knew that's what I wanted to sort of continue doing in my career. Um, and so I ended up doing uh, an internal medicine and primary care residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital um, in Boston um, mm -hmm. because they had a really right. fantastic, yeah, collaboration with also like Boston Healthcare for Homeless, which I did a little bit before even medical school. Uh, and I was able to continue my training there and have uh, one of my continuity sites at the HIV clinic at Boston Healthcare for Homeless, which was, I think, really the most transformative experience of um my life and really set me down the career path to doing addiction medicine uh, and coming here to New York and, and the Bronx and now serving the patients that I serve. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Let's talk about Boston for a minute. I'll just uh, 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 preface this by saying I did some work in Pretoria where there was a clinic with 12,000 uh, HIV positive patients uh, in the 90s before antiretrovirals uh, and one MD. Uh, 
tell us a little bit about your experience in Boston and how that shaped the next steps of your career. Yeah, so like I said, I uh, had one of my clinics in sort of like the publicly insured clinic for the hospital. So all of my patients were um, essentially on the equivalent of Medicaid. And then my second clinic was at the HIV clinic at Boston Healthcare for Almost. So all of my patients there had suffered from housing instability. Obviously, all of them had HIV. Um, and a huge, huge number obviously had um, some sort of mental health um, issues, whether it be depression, anxiety, bipolar, um, and also substance use disorders. So saw a huge number of opioid use disorders, alcohol use disorders, stimulant use disorders. Um, and it was really there that I felt so ill-equipped to sort of continue to do that care without um, appropriate expertise training. And so that is what really sort of inspired me to want to do um, fellowship training in addiction medicine. Um, and I thought, what better place to do it than to go to New York and go to the Bronx. And so um, I actually completed our first inaugural year of the fellowship um, a couple of years back and, and obviously really loved it and love our patients and, and the colleagues that I have here and have stayed on as faculty. That's great. Um, so your parents must be very proud of you. Um, where are your parent or parents and what role do they play in supporting your uh, mental health for lack of a better word? <laughs> yeah, they've, I've been very fortunate. So they're still in uh, New Mexico along with most of my family. Um, and they've always been really, really supportive of my education. Like they've always instilled in me what an important thing it is to get an education because I think it was something that they didn't really have the opportunity to go to college and graduate from college. Um, and so it always made me feel like that was very important. Um, and so even though it was always really, really important, it wasn't always clear how exactly you go about doing that, particularly if you know they hadn't done that themselves. And so, um, they were always really supportive to help me find people who did know how to do that. Um, so um, made sure that I went to a private school. I had some, some good financial aid to be able to help me to do that um, and to make sure that I had mentors um, who were able to sort of support me through that process that was so unknown to us at the time. Sure. And do you have siblings? I do, yes. I have a younger brother who also still is in New Mexico. He's still there. Mm -hmm. Most of my family is. I, um, each of my parents is actually one of six kids, and so as you can imagine, there are lots of cousins um, and grandkids yep. in the family. And and really, I think only about three of us, uh, the grandkids, have left. So um, it's nice to go back and and see everyone. But um, um, it's also nice to kind of pull them into my new world here on the East Coast too. So sure. That makes sense. Um, if you were to give advice to either a young uh, person in the Bronx or a non-traditional age adult in the Bronx about the impact of the college experience to set the stage for the next steps of their career, what would that advice be? I would say... College for me was incredibly, incredibly transformative. Um, I think it happens at a time when people are changing, you know, people are uh, going from adolescence to adulthood and it's very transformative just for that reason. Um, but for me, it was seeing a whole different world that I didn't even know existed, you know, coming from the Southwest and going to the East Coast. Um, and that experience um, has really kind of made me who I am today. And so for anyone, um, thinking about college or interested in college, I would say, you know, you should totally rally whatever resources you have around you, any supports you have, look into local resources um, for how other folks can mentor you through this process. There are so many people that have done it uh, and wanna help other people do it too. Um, so just because you might not know, know that there are a lot of people and supports around you that, that can help because um, it's a transformative time and really helped me figure out what my passions were in life um, and sort of set me down the path of medicine and more particularly addiction medicine, which is like, my absolute um, 
passion and I can't imagine doing anything else um, and feeling like I actually do work that, that hopefully helps people. That's wonderful. I want to thank Dr. Torres. I want to thank our viewers for tu tuning in. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. This is Public Health America. See you next time. Take care.